So today I'm going to talk about the climate change, human impacts and marine ecosystems and how these things are interlinked. So this is becoming a little bit more scientific because my background is scientific, but I try to um, uh, inform you in a way that is more user-friendly, I should say. But I also want to stress that uh, uh, life and uh, ecosystems are very complex. So that's why I need to show you some, something about this complexity. And, uh, and another thing, uh, maybe if we want to stress importance of ocean among us, um, uh, we should rename our planet, because our name is, our planet is called like uh, planet Earth, but we should call it planet ocean. That's much more appropriate, I think. Um, so this is to show you that uh, ecosystems are uh, actually not stable. So we are changing all the time. And uh, if the changes are small, so we can see the big things and we think it's a, uh, uh, a stability or kind of cause stability. But if uh, changes are going to be huge, then the ecosystem shifts. And the shift means that they are changing the regime. So for example, ecosystem is here, and then we have a little bit of energy that is pushed here, and then it goes to another so-called uh, semi-stable state. The problem is, is that the functioning here and functioning here is completely different, and often to come from this to here, it's uh, impossible, or you need lots of energy. And uh, uh, very often, these regime shifts are associated to the climate change. So nowadays, uh, we're talking about regime shifts and climate change. And if you look about uh, scientific publications, here you have the time, yes, and here you have the number of publications uh, published uh, per year. Then you can see how fast, almost exponentially, have uh, increased uh, scientific publication about climate change. And that means how important is this subject. Um, but nevertheless, if you look at these publications, you realize that the information is very scattered. So you have one piece of information from this area, one information from another area, but it's very difficult to put the big picture together. And uh, all the results I'm going to talk to you about today is very recent. So this is my team work. Um, in, uh, in, uh, this year and last year. And uh, first thing, what we try to do, um, we try to collect all possible time series um, uh, about our region and put it together and make a real scientific harmonized analysis on top of this. Mm -hmm. So this is a, um, uh, our country, and then you have the location of different time series, and we cover vivid everything from atmosphere to uh, terrestrial system to freshwater lakes to rivers, uh, marine ecosystems, and both abiotic and biotic, so living and non-living environment. And uh, we talk things, what was happening in the last uh, 50 years. So it's from a climate change perspective, it's a reasonably long time series. And we looked at uh, different individual time series. We used some very uh, complicated methodology to establish the regime shifts. So where you expect to get the changes. And then one series, you had lots of shifts. Then another series, you have just one shift. And then you had some uh, time series that didn't have any shifts at all. So this is lots of information, lots of complexity. And in order to summarize it, you can do it in very different ways. So um, we grouped different variables among different uh, big uh, uh, climate systems, so to say. And here you can see the black rectangle. And thi this means when uh, the regime shift happened, then the thickness of line shows you um, uh, how uniform is a uh, time series within this uh, group. And then the size of the rectangle shows you how big is a shift. So you see that something was happening everywhere in the uh, late 80s. So this is a big uh, uh, regime shift uh, in Northern Europe, but also elsewhere in the world. So you can see it from atmosphere down to the oceans. So it's happening everywhere. But if you look like individual time series, you have here lots of variability. And if I uh, show this to policymakers, uh, they don't take this evidence into account because this is too complex. And then we also produce something more user-friendly, a bit like this, and to explain what was really happening uh, uh, recently. So basically, in, in our region, we get more westerly winds. So it means we get oceanic, uh, warm air uh, in, in our, our country. 
and then uh, we get more mild winters, more precipitation, then we get uh, increased uh, river eye discharges, so we uh, change the patterns of snow and ice, uh, we increase the seawater and lake temperature, and we also decrease salinity, and that's a big problem, because if you decrease salinity, you lose all the biota, marine biota. So it's a, um, although the changes are very huge in abiotic system, what we discovered, it's a very weak and delight responses to the biota. That is very important consequence of, of, uh, of the results because what we are doing today, we can't necessarily see in the biota. So maybe this is only happening in 10 years or 20 years time. So we have to be very careful about what we're doing nowadays. Um, another example, what humans are doing. Um, uh, lots of us probably have heard about alien species. I'm not talking about those coming from Mars. I haven't seen any of those. But uh, talking about uh, species that humans are transporting from one continent to another. So those species are called aliens because evolutionarily they never have been in, a, in the same uh, or new regions before. And they don't have natural enemies and they behave very unexpectedly. Um, uh, so this is a graph, my personal view about this science, because here I came into the marine science and then um, just a few weeks afterwards we uh, found a polychid worm, um, which was a uh, new species, alien species, but at that time we didn't have any alien species. So we didn't know that this is alien, we tried to classify it according to the existing species, of course we were wrong and we realized it afterwards. But then, this is how it was. So it took another 10 years, we found another alien species, another 10 years, we found another alien species, and suddenly now, look what's happening. Every year we have a new species, and not just any species, but the species that change everything in a system. And in the next, I'm going to show you some examples. Um, uh, so we have round crab now, and uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, uh, so it's, uh, it's around Gobi and Mark Crab. Uh, so one is coming from America, North America, and another is coming from the uh, Caspian uh, Black Sea. Uh, but they are uh, similar in a way because they are predators and they're eating a lot. Um, but we immediately realize that it's not so easy. If you have a new species, uh, you might invent new methods because existing methodology is no good. You can't really know how many of those new guys are in the environment. So what we did, we realized that the diving, diving is great by the way, and it's, a, it's the best method to count those fishes. Because uh, the alien species is very uh, brave, so they're very curious. So if you go diving underwater, you're using a uh, diving frame, a bit like glittering like this. So they are lifting above the bottom and you can count them easily. You can even measure them. So it was the best methodology to see how many are we in the environment. And for the grabs, we basically built a, uh, like a uh, houses for them. So we used this uh, brick, whole bricks, and we deployed them for a certain period of time in an in ocean. And then we collected them and we knew how many are we actually. Um, and look here at the time series about this smart crab. So this is a crab tree area, so zero crabs. And this is an area currently we have lots of crabs. So they came quite recently, early uh, 2010s, and now in some locations we have over 100 crabs per square meter. Imagine this lot and 100 crabs. It's a lot, and they're very hungry. Um, and the same for the round Gobi, we did some modeling study, so we can live everywhere in our shores. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's actually a big problem now. Um, and then we wanted to know what those guys are doing. So we did some experiments, and we uh, figured out that in laboratory, they can eat everything in 10 days, and in nature, one month, and they eat it all. So they're like a vacuum cleaner going around the seafloor and eating all animals, and also plants, if no animals left. Uh, this is complicated, but, uh, but science is complicated. So, but basically here, uh, the uh, field observations. So what we have observed in real time uh, in a nature, it's no experiment, and it's a real life. So before crab, this is an amount of invertebrates, after crab, this much. So we reduced invertebrate biomass three times about. This is diversity or richness. 
and say, we lost half species, only five years. And this is even more interesting, because the crabs are not affecting only sea floor, but they affect also the water masses. So we have more nutrients in the water, and we have more phytoplankton. So, and this, this is a big consequence, because in order to get the clean Baltic Sea, or reasonably clean Baltic Sea, we have to invest lots of money in order to uh, purify the water treatment plant water, for example. The current uh, levels are not clean up anymore, and only because of these two species. So what was basically happening, this is another image of the policy making. So before, if we put some nutrients into the system, it was stocked in a biomass of invertebrates. Now we have these predators, they eat all those uh, invertebrates, and all the nutrients in a sediment and the biota is released to the water, and then we create the adverse blooms of phytoplankton. So, but this expedition is about Arctic and Antarctic, so I have some examples also from different uh, places. So uh, this year we did a modeling study about Arctic. So everybody is talking about the futures of Arctic, but there is no real uh, modeling evidence what is happening with uh, invertebrate species living there. And in order to, to, to do a modeling, so we use the existing uh, understanding about current and future, con uh, future conditions of the Arctic Sea, and we use uh, two types of variables. So below here you have a temperature, so we have a uh, bottom temperature nowadays, bottom temperature futures, and this is the difference between these two. And this is an uh, acidification uh, parameter. It's an aragonified saturation state. And, uh, and this is nowadays, this is uh, future, and this is the two uh, difference between two. And why this uh, aragonite is important? This is because we have lots of uh, invertebrates in a sea that has a shell made of calcium and all this. And if you don't have the salt in a seawater anymore, or not so much of salt, so they can't make their shells, so they get very uh, unhealthy and they're just uh, dying. So we did modeling. Oh, this is a bit uh, difficult to see. But uh, we were surprised. And first of all, uh, we were thinking that those organisms that are calcified was having these shells, so they might uh, suffer much more than non-calcified. You have the difference here. This is a loss of habitat. Uh, you have a difference, but the difference is not uh, significant. And then we also thought that the, maybe the Arctic species are getting dis uh, disappeared more likely than the border, but it was opposite. So the results are very um, uh, interesting for us and uh, surprising, but it, this is very important here. So this study is based on correlations. We are extrapolating outside of the current uh, situation. We are talking about futures. We don't have a uh, uh, current day uh, examples. So in order to really know what is happening with these guys in the future, we have to do experiments in the lab. We have to study their tolerances. And this is the future. We have to check these things, if it's true or not, and then make a prediction. But this is just to show how little we know and how little we have data, even though we, well, we are lots of scientists around. So coming to the, um, uh, to the data knowledge, then uh, you have also some solutions here. So for example, remote sensing. This is an excellent way of collecting data over the broad areas and in time. And basically what's happening in remote sensing, you have an airplane or satellite flying over the globe, and then they collect some information that is can be like a reflectance from the seafloor or something else, and then we try to validate this uh, information to, to make it understandable uh, for, for people. Uh, I'm coming to Antarctica. This is something I did uh, last year, and uh, we basically uh, first time observed uh, intertidal macroalgae in Antarctica, and we made a, uh, a connection between the uh, real coverages of different uh, macroalgal species with a satellite signal. And we, we published it, and uh, here you have some uh, evidence. Uh, 
if you use a specific uh, wavelength of reflectance, you can actually predict how much you have green algae, or brown algae, or red algae, or, or richness of algae. So this is very great, because uh, uh, in Antarctica, you can go in very selected uh, regions. And in order to have a big picture, you have to use uh, remote sensing. And another thing is, you can do it only in a few summer months. But if you want to get it, again, broader picture, half year in each, when you have light in Antarctica, so remote sensing is actually uh, a good way forward. And then we use these uh, relationships to make the predictions, and this is how it for, for looks. You can predict uh, algal biomasses in different regions, and, uh, and then you can see how much it changes. And you can compare if the changes are somehow linked to the climate change. So this is kind of baseline. So to know what is the current situation. Because if you want to monitor changes, you have to know the current situation. And about Antarctica, we don't know. I'm giving you another kind of solution. like Because as you already understood, um, uh, ecosystems are very complex. And impacts are very complicated. You have lots of interactions. And, uh, and it's not easy for non-specialists or policy makers to, to, to grasp the main message. Uh, this year, uh, we, uh, we realize that you have lots of uh, human pressures. You have uh, the diversity of pressures is increasing. Intensity of those pressures are increasing. And we are losing beautiful habitats. And in order to stop it, or even the reverse consequence, you have to do something useful. So, and if you look what scientists are doing, so we're very often doing a small scale studies, we are talking in Java, we are collecting lots of information which is not understandable for the common people. Policy makers, so we are very generic, we are talking about large things, uh, but they are influencing our futures. So we need to connect these two things. So we need a how do you call it? Uh, translation service in between these. And in order to do it, so we just generated a, uh, uh, oh, maybe it's not very important, uh, uh, we uh, generated a uh, online tool. Very simple. You open a uh, web page and uh, you can quantify cumulative impacts of different human activities on all the nature you can find in a particular area. And this is a little bit like a future planning. Um, uh, and as this is a spatial model, we included only those uh, parameters that has geography. So for example, we have benthic habitats, we have some fish spawning grounds, uh, bird seal, uh, resting areas, etc. And then uh, what we did, we uh, generated lots of spatial models about different nature values. And this is a generic uh, scheme, how this is done, maybe it's too complicated, but lots of interesting modeling, and then you have nice maps, which are realistic. So then what tools is doing, it combines different nature asset values, and it contains rules, and rules means knowledge. So we know how different human pressures are affecting different nature assets. And then users upload their followers of human users, and see what's happening. And they get the information at the local scales. Local scales means it's uh, for each uh, 100 meter. So it's really small scale thing. And this is how it's uh, looking like. So users can uh, draw polygons. Let's make here like a wind park. Here, for example, we'd like to do some fish farms. Here, maybe we're doing nature protection area. Here, perhaps we put some mussel farm. And let's see what's happening. What is the consequence in terms of loss of habitats or gain of habitats. And in order to get all this knowledge, so we extracted information from all scientific publications and put it into the system. And this is dynamic. So basically, yeah, this is the interface again. And uh, using this uh, tool, we can select the best uh, scenario. Uh, then we have uh, our application. And this is about conservation planning. Because the problem is that the protection areas of nowadays, the rare areas here, they are not good for the future. Because in future, we change temperature, salinity, we have shift of species. And those species we are protecting here, they might not be here 
but in future maybe they're here or here. So we can also use this uh, same tool to uh, analyze where are the likely uh, uh, future uh, protection areas. And then, of course, impact mitigation, because we have want to recover habitats and we can label some actions that are good for the oceans and we see how much and which actions we have to do to get the good ocean. So with this, um, uh, I basically would like to finish my talk and give that this uh, same tool is a, uh, has lots of advantages because it, uh, it's a dynamic. You can include the new data and then you can apply it to the different new regions um, and, uh, and maybe this is a way to sa save our planet because we link important knowledge and the policy advice. And we're not doing the stupid decisions in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you.